Now I'm going to share a few brief thoughts on Keynesian theory. The truth is that it would not be necessary to discuss Keynesian theory had it not been used for nearly 40 years to justify the monetary and fiscal interventionism of governments from the time of the Second World War until the poorly named oil crisis at the end of the 1970s, when Keynesianism was called into question. Another reason we need to study Keynesian theory is that even today, many economists have studied nothing else. They belong to the lost generation of economists, in the words of Hayek, and they are stuck in the Keynesian quagmire. What is more, as you will see next year, economics textbooks devote a section to the Keynesian model, and they invariably contrast it with the monetarist model, as if the two were in competition. Well, from our perspective, and that of this course, little separates the monetarists from the Keynesians. They commit the same scientific and methodological errors due to their macroeconomic view, which fails to take time and capital theory into account. Furthermore, it is important to explain Keynesian theory because it very often applied in real life, in the sense that it is behind much of the nonsense we read in articles in the economic and business press, and many of the absurdities we hear in parliamentary economic debates, etc. I am going to offer a very brief explanation, but first I would like to mention John Maynard Keynes, the founder of the model. Keynes's most curious characteristic was that he knew very little about economic theory and the history of economic thought. He studied the subject for only six months. That is, he attended economics classes for only six months. About the same amount of time you have studied the subject. He took a short six-month course taught by Marshall, and that was it. Hayek tells us that everything contained in the history of economic thought in 19th century England was certainly a closed book to him, but simply because he had not read it. However, as a person, he was quite brilliant, and he had great powers of persuasion, a voice that could charm anyone, and considerable influence in the England of his time. The influence of Keynes has been truly perverse. Keynes was a profoundly amoral person, and it is not me saying that, he himself says it in his autobiography, two memoirs. He writes that both he and his companions of the Bloomsbury group were against all pre-established morality. And he concludes that, at the age he had reached in life, not only was he amoral, but it was too late to change. He was against all principles. And that was the mindset he applied to the sphere of economics as well. He sought to make ad hoc decisions according to his own idea of what each set of circumstances called for at any particular time. To wipe the slate clean of principles which have developed and been refined in an evolutionary manner, and which provide the essential framework for the operation of a market economy. The truth is that not even Keynes himself believed what he said. Hayek tells an anecdote about running into Keynes in Cambridge after World War II and asking him if he was aware of the effects his writings were having and whether he had realized they were giving a veneer of scientific respectability to all of the mad plans of politicians. And he says Keynes responded by telling him not to worry, that just as Keynes had convinced everyone that inflation was necessary under certain circumstances, as soon as he saw people going too far, and here he apparently made a gesture with his hand, he would write another book or article to convince everyone of the opposite, and the situation would change. Hayek was stunned by that response, and he adds that, unfortunately, Keynes died shortly afterward of a heart attack, and never had a chance to change anything. And the perverse seed of his doctrines continued to exert a harmful effect on the economic world for 40 years. And talked to him after dinner and asked him whether he wasn't alarmed for what his pupils naming too. I won't name now, were doing agitating for more expansion, when in fact the danger clearly was inflation. He completely agreed with me and assured me uh, my theory was frightfully important in the 1930s for the question of uh, combating deflation. Trust me, if inflation ever becomes a danger, I'm going to turn public opinion around like this. Six weeks later he was dead and couldn't do it. I think he would have been fighting the inflationary policy. Churchill is famously quoted as saying, if you put two economists in a room, you get two opinions, unless one of them is Lord Keynes, in which case you get three opinions. Any economist would have an opinion, but Keynes would have two, 
and his two opinions would be contradictory. He invariably enjoyed shocking people by defending one doctrine and then the opposite. As soon as he had convinced everyone, he would suddenly switch doctrines. He thought he could play with people. If anyone would like to enter the world of the Bloomsbury Group, I recommend picking up the three-volume biography of Keynes written by Skidelsky. It is definitely worth reading and will give you a look at a movement which did a great deal of harm in the United Kingdom and all over the world. A group which was completely amoral in their view of the social sciences, but also in their view of personal behavior.